Hi there, and welcome to season four of Crops TV. Hopefully it's welcome back for most of you. My name is Erin Hodson, and I'm an extension entomologist at Iowa State. And along with Ashley Dean, we've prepared a presentation about blister beetles in alfalfa hay. I want to point you to our field notes. We've created a little short summary of blister beetle identification and management that we think will be helpful next summer when you actually start to think about blister beetles again. I have to be fully transparent and say that if you asked me about blister beetles this time last year, I wouldn't have had much more to say than, yeah, I think I can identify some in the field. But with a lot of the questions that Ashley and I got during the summer of 2023 about identification, scouting, and management, we had to step up our game. And so we learned a lot last summer, and I want to share the highlights with you, knowing that it's probably going to be an issue for those that are growing alfalfa hay or feed hay to animals. And so my plan for today is to review the highlights of identification and biology, some of the symptoms and treatments for blister beetles for animals, how to successfully scout for blister beetles, and then review some of the management considerations for this important insect. So in general, blister beetles can be summarized by a few general body descriptors. They belong in the beetle family Meloidae, and there's a good number of them, about 3,000 species worldwide. In general, the blister beetles would be characterized as having relatively soft bodies compared to something like Japanese beetle or ground beetles that have a very tough or rigid exoskeleton or, or exterior body. But one of the things that really sticks out to me is their first pair of wings or their forewings are soft and uh, velvety. Uh, sometimes they could be described as leathery, uh, somewhat pliable. They can be metallic, uh, sparkly, or shiny. Sometimes they almost appear to have a hairy appearance um, or smooth or even sometimes matte. So in this picture here, we have a margin blister beetle, which is one of the most common species to see in the North Central region. And to me, it looks like the head and the body, the wings, the legs have little fine gray hairs all over them. So you may see a variety of color and texture when it comes to blister beetles. Their size is also somewhat variable from one third of an inch up to one and a half inches in length but they all kind of have a similar body shape in which they're elongated and they have a very broad rectangular shaped head. But probably the most diagnostic feature or external feature of blister beetles is this constriction of the pronotum. Um, the pronotum is actually the first body segment right behind the head. And some people would refer to this as a neck. Uh, anyway, the, the neck of the blister beetle is constricted. It's as wide or it's less wide or, or more narrow than the head itself. And this is going to be really important to distinguish it from some lookalikes, which I'll share in a little bit. Now, blister beetles have the, a soft uh, leathery forewing, as I mentioned before, and it sort of rolls over the abdomen. Um, this is really different, again, from uh, beetles like Japanese beetle or mass chafers, which they have a very flattened and rigid uh, forewing. Many times blister beetles have reduced wings, so they don't typically cover the abdomen. And as you can see in the middle picture, they can be really reduced and sometimes just like look like little nubs uh, on top of the abdomen. Some blister beetles have aposematic or warning coloration. Uh, if you think about like a monarch butterfly, a bright orange vibrant color, that is a signal to predators like birds that say, don't eat me, I do not taste good, you are gonna have a stomach ache. And so some be blister beetles also have that very bright warning coloration that says, if you eat me, you're probably not gonna feel good. So if they do survive, usually they learn very quickly not to eat any more blister beetles. And then finally, blister beetles have thread-like or beaded antennae that are pretty obvious and they're prominent. They usually stand out in front of the head sticking out forward and they have tooth tarsal claws. So at the tip of their feet, like their tippy toes would be tooth and that helps them cling on to surfaces as they're moving around. 
Now, I think Ashley would probably agree with me. There are four bis- blister beetle species that are pretty common in Iowa, uh, the ash gray, black, margined, and striped. And by far, my observations in alfalfa and even soybean the last couple of summers would be ash gray and black are the two most dominant species. So again, you can see a variation of color and patterns, even the texture of the body and the wings. Um, but they also have that similar body shape, a big rectangular head and a constricted neck. Now I did mention some lookalikes and because people had some questions with uh, confirming blister beetles versus something else, this is probably the most commonly confused insect with blister beetles. It's called the goldenrod soldier beetle. Now, this beetle is actually in a different family, Cantharidae, um, and although they do have a similar size and shape, sort of the elongate, soft, leathery wings, which would be similar to blister beetles, their bodies are somewhat flattened, and, and so are their wings, so they're not curved over the abdomen. And if you notice the prothorax, or the neck, it's, it's flattened into, it almost looks like a plate right behind the head, and it is wider than the head. So this is a very quick diagnostic. This is not a blister beetle and won't have any impacts on animals. The second insect that I think gets confused with blister beetles are firefly, or sometimes they're known as lightning bugs. Again, this is a different beetle family, Lampyridae. And so there are certain areas of Iowa that just have more fireflies and they're gonna be pretty active at dawn and dusk. They have a similar size and shape, sort of elongate body, soft leathery wings, similar to blister beetle, but just like the goldenrod soldier beetle, their bodies are flattened. And if you notice the neck or the prothorax again, it's been flattened and widened and it is definitely wider than the, than the head. So uh, another example of a quick diagnostic feature to separate it from blister beetles. Okay, as I was learning about blister beetles, um, I tried to understand their life cycle. And I actually found out that it's really amazing. So beetles and butterflies, Flies, many big groups of insects have what I would call complete metamorphosis. These are four distinct life stages, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. Each life stage looks a little bit different, but usually the larvae look pretty similar to each other. So as they move through different instars and mature, as they reach pupation, the larvae just get a little bit bigger. They don't look really different from each other, but Blister beetles have changed the game into something which I didn't even know existed before called hypermetamorphosis. And again, this is something that's even more complex than complete metamorphosis. So this is the change that they go from egg to an adult. And I found a a very old illustration from Comstock book, which demonstrates just the variety of the size and shape of these different life stages. So the egg hatches into a first instar, which is very mobile and very hungry. This is the main feeding stage of the immatures. The second through the fifth instar moves into what would be called a semi-mobile grub stage. So you can see the legs are reduced, they're not gonna be as mobile, and the feeding is really reduced as they move through the second and through fifth instars. And then this is where things get interesting, uh, especially from an entomologist perspective. The six instar is a total transformation into this non-mobile, non-feeding stage. Looks completely different than all the other life stages. And it's going to stay in that phase for a little bit before it moves into the seventh and final instar. To me, this looks very similar to a grub, a C-shape that we would see in Schaefer's Uh, Japanese beetles, many of the lawn feeding or grass feeding grubs. It's not very mobile. You can see the legs are pretty reduced and they don't do a lot of feeding, but this is the overwintering stage. And then when um, they're ready to pupate, they're going to completely transform again into a resting stage where they develop wings and reproductive parts. So they are ready to become adult when they pupate um, for the last time. So just to recap, Uh, The hypermetamorphosis, there's lots of changes going on with the body. Um, They will go through this uh, generation one time per year. All the life stages are in the soil except for the adult, which is above ground. 
I put the life cycle on sort of a calendar so you could kind of see what happens during the year. Uh, right now, it's winter. They are overwintering as a grub in the soil. When soil temperatures warm up, they will pupate. And in late June uh, is when we really start seeing the first adults become active and around in the landscape. During that time, they're going to mate and lay eggs, and then they're going to slowly move um, through that first through seventh instar during the summer. I got asked a couple times if blister beetles can survive the winters, and my answer is definitely yes. The four species that I see very commonly, I don't think have any trouble overwintering, partially because they are uh, protected in the soil, just like many of the other beetles and insects that overwinter in Iowa. If I think about corn rootworm, Japanese beetle, and many other insects are insulated by the cold temperatures if they're buried underneath the soil. I also tried to create a graphic to illustrate when blister beetles would be present in alfalfa. And just knowing a little bit more about their life cycle and when adults start to emerge from the ground, they will be meeting, uh, eating and mating, laying eggs for several months, but the peak activity really is in July and August. And I'm not a forage agronomist, but just consulting with a few people that know a little bit more about alfalfa hay cuttings than me, they said, well, in Iowa, it, it is highly variable, but uh, a farmer might expect to get three or four cuttings in a year based on this, the age of the stand, where they're located, uh, maybe environmental conditions like drought stress and some other things, but it could be anywhere from three to four cuttings per year. But this graphic is just trying to demonstrate uh, when adults are present and overlapping when alfalfa is growing. And the big takeaway message is that in general, the first cutting or the first bales that we get every year are least likely to have blister beetles in them because the adults aren't active yet. And so those first cutting bales would generally be considered the safest to feed to sensitive animals, which I'll talk about in just a few moments. So I thought it was also interesting to learn a little bit more about blister beetles and that they're good moms. Uh, the females would lay several egg masses, usually around 100 per pod or per mass, near potential food sources for their offspring. So they're going to put egg masses in the soil uh, near where they think food might be. And that is things like grasshoppers and ground nesting bees. And this is typically going to be in more undisturbed areas like pastures and grasslands compared to more areas that are more maintained like row crops. When they are laying those egg masses or egg pods, they're going to cover their eggs in a protective oil to avoid predation. And I'll spend quite a bit of time talking about that oil um, in the next section. Uh, when those eggs hatch into that first instar, remember they're mobile and they're really hungry. And so they're going to hatch after about two weeks and be in search of food. And so they're going to go after grasshopper egg pods and these ground nesting bees. And they're going to feed for about four weeks before moving on to more sedentary life stages, the second through the seventh instars. The adults are not predatory. They're in, in seeking out pollen. And I've listed a number of plant families in which they prefer to eat pollen from. But I've seen them on soybean. I've seen them on alfalfa, definitely. But most of the time, if you have a diverse landscape, they're going to be most commonly found on pigweeds, asters, teasel, and nightshade. And so they're going to go where the pollen is. Remember, they're mobile, they're active, and so they're going to be moving around and in search of pollen throughout the summer, particularly July and August. Okay, we went through basically life cycle ID in that first section. We're moving on to the second section and talking about symptoms and treatments for blister beetles. Okay, the whole purpose of me talking about blister beetles and why people would care is about uh, a potent vesicant that they can release. It is a colorless, odorless, toxic terpenoid. And it's known as a blistering agent that can, can cause blisters via contact or ingestion. So if you look at the photo on the lower right, you see these orange droplets coming out 
of the joints of the legs. So if they feel disturbed, they feel threatened, they release this blistering agent through the joints of their legs or even their antennae. Now this blistering agent is highly persistent. So even if the insects aren't alive anymore and that uh, blister beetle is consumed, it can be very uh, potent. It could even survive heating or drying as well. And so to know that that uh, blistering agent persists and uh, only really slightly soluble in water. And a few slides ago, I talked about how blister beetles are good moms. Well, actually the dads are pretty nice too. Maybe this is too much information, more information than you ever wanted to know, but I thought I'd share it because I thought it was interesting. Uh, actually, only the males produce the vesicant, the cantharidin, and so they are able to share that with the females when they mate. And a lot of insects, when they mate, the males will produce what's called a spermatophore, sometimes known as a nuptial gift. So the spermatophore could contain sperm, could contain food, hydration as well that they're giving to the female to give her the best odds of um, producing successful offspring and giving her enough energy to keep producing offspring. And so the cantharidin is transferred to the female during mating. And when the female is ready to deposit her eggs close to potential food sources, she will cover her egg masses with that cantharidin oil, protect against predation. So it's a pretty amazing wedding gift that the males would transfer the cantharidin to the females. Uh, I tried to find a, a little bit more information about contact with humans. And so I reached out to a few entomologists. I reached out to a few veterinarians and dermatologists. Um, and it does something, it is something that happens occasionally. And my predecessor who worked in alfalfa had occasional contact blisters from working in alfalfa and running into blister beetles. But I, th I saw this blog of a person who spent some time in Africa document sort of the progression of the accidental dermal contact uh, that created these blisters. And so I thought I would show you sort of that progression about over a two week period. And so he noted that First exposure, that droplet touches the skin, and almost immediately there's going to be a red, itchy bump that develops. Within three to four hours, that bump expands and darkens, and then usually within 12 hours, uh, a nice big blister forms. About a day or two later, that blister will burst, and then even two weeks later, you could have a scar that remains. So depending on the size of the blister, where the blister is located, if you're a redhead like me and tend to uh, scar pretty easily, um, you could have that scar um, remain for quite a while. And so usually what happens is you have a blister beetle that'll get inside of your shirt or inside your sleeve and release those droplets. It can get inside of your pant leg as well. And almost immediately you're gonna feel a red itchy bump. So as you're trying to brush it away or uh, uh, get it away from your skin, it's going to release that vesicant. And so over a two week period, you could have this progression with accidental dermal contact uh, with yourself. However, I also learned that cantharidin is purposely used in humans. I reached out on social media to see if anyone had a personal experience with blister beetles on their skin. And I heard a couple of people say, yeah, it's a really, it's a really painful blister, but in two to three weeks, it goes away. I did have someone in Iowa reach out to me and said their daughter had a small wart on her wrist and a dermatologist purposely put cantharidin on her wart and caused that blister to, to basically burn off the wart. And I know it's, it's somewhat common practice for dermatologists to put cantharidin on a common virus that kids get on their skin to burn away that virus. A little less commonly known, but there is some exploratory research going on to look at cantharidin for alternative cancer treatments. And then you may or may not know uh, that Spanish fly is really just a concentrated cantharidin oil that people purposely ingest. And uh, without going into too much detail, it's known as an irritant when ingested. So there's some purposeful uses for cantharidin as well. 
But really, the main purpose of this presentation today with Crops TV is to talk about exposures to animals. And this is usually as animals are grazing or ingesting bales that have blister beetles in them. So whether the beetles are alive, they're dead, they might be crushed or flattened, or even uh, just body parts. If there's legs, if there's uh, the head or the antennae that's mixed in with the bales, remember cantharidin is really persistent. And so any one of these forms can still uh, make animals sick if it's accidentally ingested. And so one of the questions that Ashley and I got several times uh, last summer is how potent is it? Um, some people would compare it to cyanide or strychnine as far as some of the effects, but um, I really hate to use the term, well, it depends in extension. It's used quite a bit, but but really the potency of cantharidin depends. It depends on the be blister beetle species, and we have at least four here in Iowa, probably even more throughout the north central region. It depends on the animal that consumes the cantharidin. Cows are definitely susceptible. Uh, they can reduce the uh, cantharidin can reduce the digestibility. It can also affect milk production, the quality and quantity. Sheep, goats, alpacas, and donkeys are also pretty susceptible to ingestion of cantharidin, but really um, it's the horses that are more susceptible. And regarding most of the questions that I got this year were uh, revolving around horses that are accidentally ingesting blister beetles. It also depends on the age and size and health of the animal. So a young horse is definitely more susceptible than an older horse. Or maybe you have a pregnant horse, she would be more susceptible than say a male horse. Uh, but I did find some information, it's not the most current, but in 1985, there was a fact sheet put out um, that documented the cantharidin level, the milligrams per beetle, uh, for a couple different species. And it's three different species that we do have here in Iowa. The black and ash gray blister beetles produce similar amounts, but it's really the striped beetle that uh, produce significantly more cantharidin than the other beetles. And there was also an extension publication that came out of Georgia that said, assuming 0.5 or one milligram of cantharidin for every 2.2 pounds of body weight is a lethal dose, they tried to estimate the number of blister beetles it would take to kill a horse. This is also a question that Ashley and I got, like how many does it take to make them sick or how much would it take to kill an animal? And so this is not exact science. These are really rough numbers, but you could see here they, have, they lumped into four different body weights, say of a full versus an adult horse and four ranges of cantharidin. And again, assuming 0.5 to one milligrams would be a lethal dose. Um, it would take hundreds of blister beetles to cause death, but um, you could have 40, 50, 60 blister beetles in a foal, and you could have some mild, moderate, or even severe symptoms. But you know, the whole reason I'm talking about this today is because of some conversations that I had with extension specialists around the state crowd consultants, and also some veterinarians um, that were wondering about, you know, how much does it take? And they wanted to get a clarification of some of the symptoms. And so this would give you a ballpark number um, if you had ingestion of these kinds of numbers for different horses. To the best of my ability, I'm trying to summarize some of the symptoms. I am not a veterinarian, of course, I'm an entomologist, but these are some of the symptoms and basically three different stages of ingestion uh, from cantharidin that you could expect to see um, based on the type of animal um, and the age, size, and health. So about six hours to three days after ingestion, some animals would experience mild symptoms. Uh, basically, they don't wanna eat. They could be producing excess saliva. They could seem depressed or um, have a lot of teeth grinding. Uh, sometimes they just don't wanna move around the area in which they normally could move around, but probably the most classic symptoms is that they would try and dunk their face 
or muzzle into water. And they're not drinking, they're just dunking their face in the water. Um, and so over that three-day period, they could experience some dehydration. And sometimes they can just uh, be sweating more than would be normally seen. In some cases, you have some animals that would experience some moderate symptoms, usually one to three days after ingestion. You could have a number of mouth blisters, so that could be on the gums and the tongue and the throat, colic and fever symptoms, increased heart rate and breathing rate, and then just a long list of digestive tract issues in which the most classic uh, symptom would be trying or straining to urinate, but they're not able to. And part of that reason is that they're dehydrated. Um, some severe symptoms of accidental ingestion could happen three plus days after they have blister beetles in the digestive tract, including some really severe tremors, dark mucal membranes, they become very uncoordinated where they're stumbling or tripping, even falling down. They um, are very hard to stand up and sometimes they don't wanna remain standing so they'll try to lay down. And then the digestive tract symptoms uh, become much more severe, including internal bleeding. Uh, they could enter shock, have abortions of some of the um, babies, and then also eventually lead to death. And uh, unfortunately, we did have, or I did hear of reports of some dead horses last year because of very severe symptoms of cantharidin ingestion. So I did label this section as symptoms and treatments, but unfortunately, there are no treatments for the ingestion or even contact uh, with blister beetles and the vesicants. So if there is suspected contact or ingestion, whether it's on a human or an animal, you should be contacting a doctor or a vet respectively immediately. Uh, the sooner the better. They can confirm cantharidin with a sample of gastric content, so from the stomach or a urine sample. But basically for humans, um, it does tend to resolve itself uh, over a two to three week period, and they would probably recommend pain relievers and hydration. In addition, animals, they would be sometimes uh, asking for activated charcoal, mineral oils, or basically anything to get that carotene through the digestive tract as soon as possible. But again, consulting with a doctor or vet is really, really important in this case. Okay, I did want to transition to my third part of my presentation, just uh, trying to better understand how and when to scout for blister beetles. Um, remember, they are fairly mobile in the adult stage and they're highly aggregated. I tend to think of them as like the party animals because when you see one, you're gonna see a lot and they're always on the move for a better party. So they often cluster together. Uh, and so when you see one, you see a lot. As I mentioned before, the females do prefer to lay eggs in undisturbed areas like pastures or grasslands. So that's where at least the females tend to be most commonly located. But um, they are in search of pollen for themselves. And so they're going to be on the move and uh, thinking about where alfalfa or other crops might be adjacent to pastures and grasslands is where I would first focus my scouting efforts. Uh, they tend to be around the perimeter more than the field interior. So if I simply wanted to know if I had blister beetles presence or absence, I'm going to be spending time in pastures or grasslands or the area that's closest to that, just along the perimeter. If I'm finding blister beetles around the perimeter, I might spend more time in the field interior to see relative numbers and maybe what kind of species I have. Uh, blister beetles tend to move quite a bit more during drought, and so we certainly have experienced that in Iowa the last couple years. Maybe that's why people have been asking Ashley and I more questions about it because they're just on the move and happen to be in alfalfa more than they typically are and um, they are easily disturbed. Remember that defense mechanism releasing the cantharidin, uh, they uh, do not like to be disturbed. And so if you're walking through an area that's infested 
or you're bringing equipment through that area, they're going to try and uh, get away from that area by uh, kind of getting excited and flying away to the next uh, party, so to say. And so sometimes when people are cutting or spraying in alfalfa, they notice these swarms, which part of that could include blister beetles, just trying to find a better spot uh, to feed and mate. Uh, based on their life cycle and their phenology, I would say you're most likely to find beetles in July and August. However, you, you could find some in June. Uh, but I would say the key timing for scouting would be a day or two before that field is planned to be cut. Because uh, if you're noticing them then, um, that would be a, a, a decision to make about what to do, maybe delay harvest and, and some other management considerations. You could walk through these fields or I think more effectively, you could use a sweep net and that would help dislodge the blister beetles that are feeding in the upper to mid canopy. Although it's very time consuming and probably not practical, depending on the value of the animals that you're feeding, you may want to inspect the underneath of the windrows before baling to see if you're finding any blister beetles, dead, alive, crushed, or even body parts, kind of sifting through that material before it's baled is really important. And then whether you are feeding your own hay or buying hay from somebody else, it is strongly recommended to take some subsamples of those bales to see if you're noticing any blister beetles. Again, these are very time consuming tasks, but based on the value of the animal, it may be very well worth it. Okay, I wanted to move to my final uh, section here, which is a management considerations to minimize the impact uh, through contact or ingestion to yourself or to animals. When it comes to you, uh, if you happen to be working in gra grasslands, pastures, alfalfa, or any other crops where there could potentially be b blister beetles, it's important to think about um, that they are very easily disturbed and kind of sketchy and move around a lot. So if they happen to land on you, try and blow them off or shake them off. Don't attempt to brush them off or pick them up and remove them from your body because they will definitely release that cantharidin droplets through those joints. If you happen to be doing some other projects in and around those fields, wearing vinyl gloves and eye protection is also recommended. And then just smart PPE is just washing clothes that are potentially contaminated if you happen to be scouting fields because the oils could soak through your clothing and get onto your skin. But when it comes to management considerations for animals, really the main goal is to discourage the beetles from coming into alfalfa in the first place. And they're in search of pollen. If the fields are flowering, that's going to be a very big attractant to those adults trying to find pollen. So my suggestion would be to cut alfalfa before it flowers. And sometimes this is a hard choice depending on the quality, quantity goals that you might have for that field. But cutting it just before flowering can minimize th that attractiveness. Hopefully they won't even enter those fields. But depending on the surrounding landscape, um, pastures, grassland, some other undisturbed areas, you could have a lot of flowering plants or um, maybe even considered weeds within and around fields too. You'd want to minimize that, especially during the peak season, July and August, when the activity of the adults is highest. Also, considerations is just let the beetles leave. And remember, they're easily disturbed. So moving equipment through the field is going to cause uh, basically you're going to uh, crush or kill, uh, maybe break apart the beetles that might get scooped up in the baling process. Also crimping or conditioning plants can also cause beetles to get crushed and remain in the material that's about to be baled. 
Um, allowing wind road hay to completely dry is going to give those beetles that do survive the process a chance to leave. They're not going to want to remain in that field that's been cut because there's nothing for them to eat and it's not a place that they would prefer to lay eggs. And so allowing that wind road hay to just remain in the field a few days before trying to bale it could improve the chances um, that the beetles leave on their own and don't get mixed up uh, in the bales. Ashley and I had a lot of questions about using insecticides. Say you were scouting, you noticed a lot of beetles in the field. Should an, a foliar insecticide be used? Um, this is a really tough judgment call to make because uh, no doubt a foliar insecticide that makes contact with a blister beetle is going to kill it but we can't always guarantee that they won't make it into the bales because if they remain on the plants or get scooped up during the windrow or baling process, remember they still could be potentially harmful to animals that ingest that hay. Um, so even if they're dead or crushed, they're still toxic. And just moving the equipment around, again, can cause uh, beetles could get crushed and picked up later during the baling process. And then just as a side note, remember that insecticides sprayed onto crops, especially crops that are going to be fed to animals. It's important to look at the label for pre-harvest intervals uh, to decide when you can spray and when it's safe to feed those animals on an insecticide basis. And I, it, I try to emphasize this just thinking about when the bales would be safest to feed sensitive animals like horses, looking at the phenology of when plants are growing and then when beetles are active. So the, the best bet for minimizing risk of blister beetles and hay is to reserve or save the first cutting bales for horses, especially young horses or pregnant horses. Uh, depending on the size and the shape of the field that is being cut for alfalfa hay, the turn areas or the bales that are created in those uh, perimeter uh, areas of the field are a higher risk of having blister beetles. And not only because they tend to aggregate around the perimeter, but the equipment themselves can crush or kill and uh, the body parts can be picked up uh, during the, the remaining process. And Again, this may or may not be a practical recommendation, but if the perimeter areas or the turn areas, those bales could be segregated from the field interior, that might also be a way to minimize the risk of having blister beetles fed to sensitive animals. So thinking about, depending on how many times you have to turn around, and again, the size and the shape, sometimes you might be able to segregate those bales from the field interior. Okay, so I talked a lot about growing alfalfa used for hay, but say you have animals to feed like horses, but you don't grow your own food and you have to buy it from somebody else. It is really important to ask that person that you're buying from, where did the hay come from? Uh, because there might be certain parts uh, of Iowa and beyond where there's more likely to have blister beetles. And this is especially true for the last couple of years when we've had drought stress and people have had to buy or supplement more feed than say in a typically um, average uh, year with moisture. Uh, you could ask, when was it harvested? Uh, was it the first cutting or the third cutting? It could really make a difference. And at what point in the plant life stage or growth stage uh, did they harvest? Because if flowers were present, the likelihood of having blister beetles is increased versus saying, versus if you had vegetative alfalfa. You could ask them if they were uh, able to scout a few days before cutting and or if they treated for blister beetles. And then ask them if they had any plan for how it was baled and if they were able to segregate the cuttings or parts of the bales um, from the fields versus the maybe the field interior. That would uh, offer some uh, safety or reduced risk compared to maybe higher risk where you have uh, bales made in, from the second and third cuttings. Okay, if I could have or summarize some burning blister beetle takeaways, sorry, that was a bad pun, um, is to minimize the food options or the attractiveness of alfalfa by uh, harvesting before flowering. Scout field edges first, 
just to see if there's any blister beetles present and then maybe spend some more time in the field interior. Uh, it's important to know that dead or alive, crushed, or even just body parts are still very toxic to animals. Um, so inspecting windrows and bales is another added layer of safety that you can provide, although very, very time consuming. And so um, my bottom line recommendation is to save the first cutting bales for your most sensitive animals, which probably would be horses. I'd like to thank you again for your time and attention. I hope this information was helpful to you. Again, check out the field notes because that is going to be a summary of the big takeaways from this presentation next summer when you actually are thinking about blister beetles and feeding them to animals. Thank you.